Hi, I'm Pastor Scott Ingram from Omega Baptist Church in White Pine, Tennessee. Today I'm going to answer the question, what is the differences between the KJV and the ESV, uh, English translations of the Bible? discussion of Bible translations can become very passionate. I've heard of some people actually claiming that if you didn't use their version of the Bible, then you must not be saved. Now that's just crazy. Um, I don't believe that, but I do believe this is an important topic for every Christian to study over. I'm just going to lay out some simple facts about these two different English translations. And I ask you, please, uh, watch to the end of the presentation because uh, I'm sure to say something that may offend or disturb uh, someone about what you believe, but uh, God is a God of truth, and I just want to share the simple facts about this. So please, no matter what your conviction, please listen to the end of this presentation. I started ministry many years ago, and I started using an NKJV Bible back then, but now I use a KJV. I have read through the ESV before, and uh, many people like the ESV. A lot of people are now uh, using it today in a lot of conservative ministries, and I think we should take a close look at its origins, where it comes from, and the KJV as well. So I remember when I was growing up, uh, we heard about other translations, but in reality, no one really used them in the church where I went to. Most people used the KJV during that time, and that was considered the, authority, the authoritative Bible. Then there came this plethora of English translations, and it was advertised that they were simply being used to make the Bible easier to read. But with a different English translation appearing every few years, uh, one wonders why the constant change. I mean, I think I can still understand the English that was taking place in the 1950s. But did you know that from 1950 all the way to the year 2000, there were 64 different English translations that were put upon the market? Now, why in the world would we need over a, one translation a year coming out. The English language wasn't changing that much, and the ESV come out and added to that in 2001 when it was first published. Now, I remember having a discussion with my father uh, during that time and saying, Dad, why would we not want to look at these other English translations? They're just there to make it easier for us to understand. And uh, I thought that that was the purpose of them. They were just to uh, updating the language, but there was more to it than that, and that's the differences that we'll see between these two translations today. To begin to understand this, you need to understand that the Bible wasn't originally written in English at all. As a matter of fact, the Old Testament was originally written mainly in Hebrew, and the New Testament mainly in Greek. And uh, we know that Jesus points directly to those uh, specific original languages when he talks about the Word of God being unchanging. He says in Matthew 5.18, For verily I say unto you that till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. A jot or a tittle is a uh, Hebrew uh, punctuation. So we know he was speaking to the original languages when he spoke about that matter. Those original handwritten documents were lost to time, but many copies were made of them. I believe those words are still here with us today, though, and have been preserved in every generation, straight from the Eastern churches where they were first written down. Uh, today we have over 5,000 handwritten copies of uh, those original words and different uh, manuscripts, and they all have a percentage of differences among them. But by examining these, theologians have been able to compile uh, common references of Hebrew and Greek used for translation into other languages. From the Eastern Church's Greek reference and the Masoretic Hebrew text reference, there came a succession of English translations, including the Wycliffe, the Tyndale, uh, the Bishop's Bible, the Great Bible, and the Geneva. The authorized version, which was put in motion by King James I, was completed in 1611. It has come to be considered the standard in English translations for the last four centuries. It would be slightly updated from 1611 with four updates until 1769. The history of the ESV begins in the early 1990s when Lane T. Dennis, president of the nonprofit publishing ministry Crossway, discussed the need for a new literal translation of the Bible with various Christian scholars and pastors. The starting point for the ESV translation was the 1971 edition of the Revised Standard Version. Now first I want to begin with some of the similarities of the KJV and the ESV. First of all, the KJV and the ESV are both literal translations. 
Dave Coteau, an associate professor of biblical studies at Liberty University, explains the difference in literal translations and other types of translation philosophy. He says, formal equivalence, word-for-word -word translation, attempts to translate the Bible as literally as possible, keeping the cynic structure and idioms intact if possible. Examples would be the NASB, the KJV, the ESV. A functional equivalence, though, a thought-for-thought -thought translation, attempts to translate the text so it has the same effect on the current reader as it had on the ancient reader. An example would be the New Living Translation. Optimal equivalence falls between the former approaches by balancing the tension between accuracy and the ease of reading. And the ESV is considered to be an essentially literal translation. <clears throat> now, if the KJV and the ESV are both literal translations, there must be no differences, right? Well, it's a bit more complicated than that. Let's take a look now at the differences. First of all, there are two different Greek texts being used for the KJV and the ESV. And the Hebrew is slightly different as well. And they have substantial differences between them. And the KJV and the ESV could be the poster child for each one of these different Greek New Testaments. I want you to take a look at this chart. This is a chart created by Lifeway to advertise their new CSB translation. Now, Bibles that are being presented to the right are more literal than other Bibles are. Now you see there the ESV is said to be the most literal and the KJV is the third literal. Now it's a bit deceptive though because the KJV is using a different Greek New Testament to translate from than the ESV. You see the KJV uses the traditional Greek text for the New Testament which is called the Textus Receptus or the traditional text. Uh, it is the same Greek text that was used by the Eastern churches and still is used by the Eastern churches today. The ESV uses a different base text uh, to translate called the critical text. Uh, Dr. David Sorensen, the author of Touch Not the Unclean Thing, describes this text. It deletes 19 verses. 45 verses have large chunks deleted and 2,800 Greek words are deleted. That's the equivalent of first and second Peter. Now the NKJV, which uses the same Greek New Testament as the KJV, within its preface has some information as to how this other Greek New Testament has come about a after centuries after the traditional text was pretty much accepted by most of the Christian world. It says in the preface, the King James New Testament was based on the traditional text of the Greek-speaking churches, first published in 1516, and later called the Textus Receptus, or Received Text. Although based on the relatively few available manuscripts, these were representative of many more which existed at the time, but only became known later. In the late 19th century, B. Westcott and F. Hort taught that this text had been officially edited by the 4th century church, but a total lack of historical evidence for this event has forced a revision of the theory. It is now widely held that the Byzantine text that's the, out of the Greek churches, that largely supports the Textus Receptus, has as much right as the Alexandrian or any other tradition to be weighed in determining the text of the New Testament. In other words, this Westcart and Hort, they taught that the text that the people were using was corrupted because it sounded too smooth, it was too familiar, and uh, there, were too many trans, uh, there were too many manuscripts of them to be recognized as being true because surely God couldn't have preserved it that perfectly down through time. The preface continues, Since the 1880s, most contemporary translations of the New Testament have relied upon a relatively few manuscripts discovered chiefly in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Such translations depend primarily on two manuscripts, Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus, because of their greater age. The Greek text obtained by using these sources and the related papyri, our most ancient manuscripts, is known as the Alexandrian text. However, some scholars have grounds for doubting the faithfulness of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus since they often disagree with one another, and Sinaiticus exhibits excessive omission. Uh, I understand that I'm just a random preacher and you just found me here on the internet somewhere and you're listening to what I've had to say this far. But I want you to hear this from an actual person who's had uh, so much 
uh, history with uh, Bible translation, um, how could you not hear what he has to say? And that man is Arthur Farstad. He was the general editor of the NKJV. He was a world-renowned scholar of the original languages. Uh, he was also the general editor for the Open Bible Study Bible that many of you probably have, and the Believer's Bible Commentary. One of the best explanations for how these two different texts came together, I read in his book, In the Great Tradition, uh, so many years ago. And I just simply want to read uh, a portion of that to you. Until the 19th century, the Greek texts used by Bible translators were fairly uniform, being based on ancient manuscripts that were in substantial agreement. As a result, there were few questions raised concerning the conformity of the then current Greek text to the original autographs written by the hands of the evangelists and apostles. But in the 19th century, many earlier manuscripts of the Greek New Testament were discovered that caused some Bible scholars to change their approach toward evaluating the Greek text. This was important for Bible translating because the text of the older manuscripts was somewhat different from the Textus Receptus in a number of places. Simply because of their antiquity, many scholars regarded them as better copies of the original autographs, and thus more authoritative than the later manuscripts on which the Textus Receptus was based. The 19th century discovery of these manuscripts, differing somewhat from the traditional text, caused scholars to consider how to determine which differing readings were original and which were later changes. Finally, many accepted a theory developed by Fenton John, Anthony Hort, and Brooke Foss Westcott. These authors propounded their theory in their two-volume work, published in 1881, The New Testament and the Original Greek. Westcott and Hort advocated that genealogical relationships among manuscripts were of primary importance and that the evidence from kinds of text, text types, thus identified, should be evaluated on the basis of how often a particular text type is found to be correct. Thus, a text type that has the reputation for being correct most often should be given more weight as a witness than one that is frequently wrong. On the basis of their investigation, they identified four principal text types which they called the Syrian, the Western, the Alexandrian, and the Neutral. The text they regarded as the latest and the least reliable they called Syrian, but is generally called Byzantine today. It is the type from which the text of Erasmus was made and that lies behind the King James in all early translations. The very smoothness and completeness of the text led these scholars to believe that it was late, edited, and hence corrupt. Hort taught that the text is in such a vast majority of extant manuscripts because the Byzantine church made it her official text. There is no historical evidence for this, however. Westcott and Hort's favored text they called neutral, a name now rejected as too biased. This is the text heavily dependent on Codex Vaticanus, their very favorite early manuscript, and Codex Sinaiticus, their second most favorite text. Some scholars, however, were disturbed that a mere handful of recently discovered manuscripts, often from 3 to 5 percent, no matter how much older, should be made to counterbalance the hundreds of years of reliance on the traditional text and the overwhelming multitude of manuscripts supporting it. The most outspoken of these was John Bergen. He favored the Byzantine text, Westcott and Hort's Syrian, because it is supported by the vast majority of manuscripts. He regarded Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus as corrupt and unreliable as witnesses to the original text. Instead, he favored the witness of the early church fathers and versions, asserting that these witnesses supported the Byzantine text, which is essentially the Textus Receptus. In most recent times, textual scholars have classified the manuscripts into differing text types from those of Westcott and Hort. They have also departed from such extreme dependence on Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, giving more weight to other early witnesses such as the papyri. Many scholars are willing to include the Byzantine text in their formula rather than totally ignore this large segment of evidence. In addition to this, modern scholars choose the reading they think best fits the context and according to what they believe a copyist would be most likely to write. Thus, they produce what is essentially an eclectic text, that is, one based on choosing individual readings rather than following a certain textual theory. The resultant text, often called the critical text, 
is used in most modern translations of the New Testament. It is not markedly different from Westcott and Hort, but has a wider base. So one has to come to a conclusion. Do we trust the majority of manuscripts that are all coming from the area where the original text was written more than these others? Uh, do we now need, after 2,000 years after the writing, to put our trust in older manuscripts that were laid aside and uh, not used for centuries and say that they are more correct than the ones that we've been looking at for centuries? Are we to trust the modern ideas of what the original writers were trying to write down uh, 2,000 years later? Or do we trust the testimony of the church across the centuries about what was actually in the text? These are the things that you have to answer when it comes to this textual criticism issue. So there is a big difference that isn't being referenced in that chart that was advertised by Lifeway. I think we've now clarified that using the Textus Receptus or the critical text is a substantial difference in the KJV and the ESV. Now let's move over to three more things. A moldable text versus an immovable text. Now the KJV has always been open to all, but it has never been open to be changed. But the ESV often molds its text to different groups that are interested in using it. For example, uh, the Gideons uh, just recently came into a problem because they used a modern text and they used the KJV. Well, of course they used the NKJV because it used the Textus Receptus New Testament. But when they uh, found that the NKJV was going to be sold off to a different company, uh, they became concerned. The ESV offered them the ability to add all those verses back into the ESV if they would simply uh, use their uh, Bible as their modern text. It says in the preface to this Textus Receptus Gideon's Bible that is now passed out, at the request of the Gideons and appreciation for their worldwide century plus distribution of more than 1.8 billion Bibles, Crossway is pleased to grant permission to the Gideons to include certain alternative readings based on the Textus Receptus for exclusive free distribution of a Gideon's edition. And they explain it this way in case you think the ESV and Crossway doesn't understand that there are two different New Testaments. Bible translation of the New Testament into English and other languages are almost exclusively based on either the Greek Textus Receptus Manuscript Tradition, which was the basis for the 1611 translation of the KJV Bible, or B, the Greek NAUBS Manuscript Corpus, which is the basis for almost all Bible translations completed since the late 1800s. In some places in the New Testament, the ESV Gideon's edition is printed and distributed exclusively under license to the Gideon's International. The Gideon's edition follows the Textus Receptus Manuscript Tradition, which corresponds in the vast majority of inst instances to the corpus of New Testament Greek manuscripts known among scholars today as the majority text. The ESV is willing to be whatever it needs to be to press its influence throughout the world. While the KJV encourages certainty, the ESV encourages modern ways of doubt. If you've ever read an ESV, an NIV, an NASB, you've noticed that there are certain areas where they have brackets around translations. And sometimes they'll put a little uh, title at the front that says, um, this isn't in the best manuscripts. This isn't in the earliest manuscripts. And there is an encouragement of doubt there. You will see this at the end of Mark 16, starting at verse 9. And you will see this in the story of the adulterous woman who was forgiven by Jesus in John chapter 8. Now, while there's been so much said about Mark 16 that it shouldn't be in our Bibles, it should be cast away, there's uh, some famous uh, Bible teachers that have actually made these uh, claims in, a, in, a, in their final sermons uh, that we should just cut away that particular passage of Scripture. But there's actually a great deal of uh, certainty about that, that it should be in there. Just because it's not in those two early manuscripts doesn't mean that it does not have a rich history behind it. Uh, Arthur Farstad uh, gives us a little bit of defense for Mark 16 here. Some of the oldest manuscripts do not have Mark 16, 9 through 20. These notes are misleading. The sum of the oldest manuscripts are really just two Greek manuscripts. Actually, the reliability of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus is strictly a theory, though widely taught. Also, one of these two manuscripts contains space for the missing paragraph, a very unusual thing when using expensive vellum, which is fine animal skins. Apparently, the scribe was aware of the passage, but lacked it in his exemplar. The other manuscript shows evidence of having been tampered with to fill up the space. 
It is common to say the style of Mark 16, 9 through 20 is unlike Mark's, but this is subjective. Actually, there are stylistic parallels between Mark 16 and Mark 1. Verse 8 of chapter 16, where the two minority manuscripts close, ends with the little word gar, for in Greek, which is usually the second word in a sentence. To end a book on this word seems most unlikely. Also, especially if one accepts the theory that Mark is the oldest gospel, we would have the resurrection story ending without the risen Christ actually appearing. A disappointing Easter indeed. Some try to solve the problem by saying that the original ending is lost in verses 9 through 20 or a makeshift substitute. This seems a very weak theory in light of our Lord's promise that his words would never pass away, Matthew 24, 35. Frankly, one fears that some would like to be rid of the passage because of verses 16 through 18 on the doctrines of baptism and miracles. The point that the footnotes in most Bibles fail to report is that 1,400 manuscripts do contain this passage. Further, St. Jerome, when he translated the New Testament into Latin, included Mark 16, 9 through 20. It is significant that he did so in the 4th century when the descending Egyptian manuscripts were also written. Apparently, these two copies, which lacked the passage, were not representative in their own time. In short, the long ending of Mark is on firm foundation and widely supported. Another way the ESV encourages doubt is it comfortably inserts actual error into the text of Scripture. You're looking here at uh, John 7, 8-10 in the English Standard Version. It says here, it's speaking of Jesus, he tells the people, you go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up. Not publicly, but in private. And the footnotes add, some manuscripts add, yet. Those footnotes refer to the Textus Receptus. John 7, 8-10, through 10, though, in the King James Version says, Go ye up into this feast. I go not up yet into this feast, for my time is not yet fully come. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up into the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. Now you understand the problem here. By removing this little word yet, you have the Lord lying. He is saying that I'm not going to the feast, and then he goes up to the feast. The Lord Jesus Christ never lied. So, can we, which manuscript evidence will you trust? There is also the controversy of the supposed verses that need to be deleted from the New Testament. Right here you're seeing some of the verses deleted from the ESV. One that particularly bothers me is Acts 8.37, and it details there the uh, way that the Ethiopian eunuch was baptized by Philip. Uh, Philip had shown him the gospel, and then the Ethiopian eunuch looks up and says, uh, What hinders me from being baptized? At that point, uh, Philip looks to him and he says this, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now here it is in the ESV. You'll notice that verse 37 is missing. And it's been put down into a footnote at the bottom saying that some manuscripts add all or most of this verse. The obvious problem here is you've cast away the idea of believer's baptism. The idea that you must be saved before uh, you are baptized. And this is an important part of scripture. Uh, and the sad thing is it doesn't need to be deleted. If you look at some of the church fathers and what they say, in times before uh, the oldest manuscript we have, they actually quote this verse. Irenaeus in 180 AD, Philip declared that this was Jesus and that the scripture was fulfilled in him, as did also the believing eunuch himself. And immediately requesting to be baptized, he said, I believe Jesus Christ to be the Son of God. Cyprian in 250 AD, in the Acts of the Apostles, lo, here is water. What is there which hindered me from being baptized? Then said Philip, if you believe with all your heart, you may. Now those church fathers predate the earliest manuscripts they have today of this particular passage. Finally, a constantly changing text versus a preserved, consistent text. 
Now, the ESV has had a large number of revisions in a relatively short amount of time since its inception in 2001. This occurred in 2007, 2011, and most recently in 2016. It caused some people to get kind of concerned that they're constantly changing the text. So in 2016, uh, the Crossway Board of Directors and the ESV Translation Oversight Committee got together and said they were solidifying the text forevermore. They said this, the ESV Bible will remain unchanged in all future editions printed and published by Crossway, in much the same way that the King James Version has remained unchanged ever since the final text was established almost 250 years ago in 1769. This final version, which was to be called the permanent text of the ESV Bible, never made it to fruition. Oh, the changes came that were going to be in that text, but they said they just could not say they wouldn't change it in the future in less than a week after making that proclamation. In the statement, they explained, Our goal at Crossway remains as strong as ever to serve future generations with a stable ESV text. But the means to that goal we now see is not to establish a permanent text, but rather to allow for ongoing periodic updating of the text to reflect the realities of biblical scholarship, such as textual discoveries or changes in English over time. These kinds of updates will be minimal and infrequent, but fidelity to scripture requires that we remain open in principle to such changes as the Crossway Board of Directors and the ESV Translation Oversight Committee see fit in years ahead. Now, did you hear that? They say that you can make no mistakes. They will change the text again in the future. So the ESV your grandpa had will not be the same as the one that your grandchild will have. It will change over time. Acts 8.37, that passage that particularly bothered me, it started out, by the textual critics in some translations as being in brackets within the text for a period of time. But eventually, you know what happened? They eventually moved that on down to the footnotes, away from the text, away from any trust in what it said. Right now you're looking at Luke 23, 34 in the English Standard Version. This is one of the most powerful statements of our Lord Jesus Christ while he was being hung on the cross. It says, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And look at the footnote. Some manuscripts omit the sentence. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Could it be possible that one day these great words of Jesus that have stirred so many to stand in the midst of persecution and love their enemies could be stripped away from the text because some scholar in some office decided 2,000 years after the fact that it didn't belong. Could it be that Luke 23, 34 would one day simply say, and they cast lots to divide his garments? Now, I've given you a lot of information today, and some of it may have been uh, amazing to you, shocking to you in some places, but every bit of this is factual truth that I've shared with you today. And you've got to decide what you're going to do with it. The scripture says, Stay to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I hope you're enjoying the sermons here and have subscribed to my channel on YouTube, but I would love even more to meet with you in person at the church where I'm blessed to pastor at in White Pine, Tennessee, Omega Baptist Church.